Okay, good. All right, well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the kickoff of the 2020-2021 Anne Arundel Bird Club Community Lecture Series. Um, for those of you somewhat new to Zoom, or even for those of us who need reminders, uh, just a couple of basic functions. I think everybody is on mute. You'll want to keep yourself on mute so the little microphone is red with a slash through it. And that, I should probably, no, I won't share my screen, that might mess it up. So down the lower left corner, for those on a, a laptop, you can do that. Um, feel free to either leave your video on or during the presentation, you can turn your video off as well. It would be probably good, I think if you go to, um, uh, speaker view, which you probably default to, but once a presentation starts, I think it goes to that. If you have questions, uh, use that chat button at the bottom and type your questions in there. I will monitor that. And um, do you, Katie, do you feel comfortable answering during the presentation? Would you rather wait till the end? Uh, I'm okay with either, whatever. Okay works best for you. All right, well, if something comes in that seems kind of pertinent, pressing to what you're talking about, I might interrupt when you take a breath. Sure. Uh, otherwise, we'll wait to the end. Um, we are recording the session tonight, um, and we will post it uh, on the Anne Arundel Bird Club Facebook page, and we'll get that information out. We'll probably leave it up for two weeks, which would be to the end of the month. So uh, I know a few people had asked about uh, whether this will be recorded and they could look at it later. So the answer to that is yes. And we'll try to send that out to everybody who registered and to the various bird club chapters. So um, with that, uh, we'll, we'll uh, kick off here. Um, I got to tell you, <laughs> um, Third time wasn't a charm, but three strikes and you're not out. Um, we, we had Katie book for three consecutive years to, to do the John Bud Taylor wildlife lecture at Quiet Waters Park. Um, a freak snowstorm, illness, and now COVID has scrapped those three in-person meetings. But doggone it, I wanted to hear this talk. <laughs> so... We persisted and we are all here tonight. I really was freaking out thinking we were totally hexed because the power went out at our place at about 6.30. Um, I was really freaking out. Um, I'll have to apologize to my wife and my cats later. <laughs> but uh, power came back on, I figured everything out so um, we are here, we are gonna make this work. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Katie. Katie Fallon told the world what she loved at a very early age. Her first word was bird. And to this day, she is the only person I've met who can make that claim. She's the author of the nonfiction books, Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird, uh, which just had its uh, second, um, Revision, well, first revision, uh, second version published uh, a few weeks ago, apparently. And also Cerulean Blues, A Personal Search for a Vanishing Songbird, uh, which was a finalist for the Reed Award for Outstanding Writing of the, on the Southern Environment. Katie is also the author of two books for children. Her essays and articles have appeared in a variety of journals and magazines. And she has taught creative writing at Virginia Tech and West Virginia University as well as in the low residency master of fine arts programs at Chatham University and West Virginia Wesleyan College. She's the a founder of the nonprofit Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia and has served as president of the Mountaineer chapter of National Audubon Society. And I'm going to put something in here um, that she didn't um, ask me to put in, but Katie is one of the birds and beans coffee company's Voices for the Birds. Um, and I always shamelessly put plugs in for Birds and Beans Coffee, the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership, my day job, 
has worked with Bill Wilson at Birds and Beans, and we have a uh, partnership going that uh, you, the code that we have, you can get a 5% discount off your coffee order. And then the Bird Conservation Partnership gets a 5% donation of all coffee sold during the year using that code, which is really nice. Um, so if you go to the MarylandBirds.org site and then slash coffee, that'll get you to there. Um, there's a lot more really interesting information on her website, uh, katiefallon.com. Um, and Katie says she does have books and she can sign books and send them to people. Um, she can take Venmo or send a check. Um, so I guess we can work out maybe the exact details that I can send out um, after that if people want books for that. So after all the failures, the missed opportunities, the snowstorms, I am so happy to finally be able to introduce Katie Fallon. Katie, go ahead, take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for continuing to try to have me <laughs> at your meetings. Yes, the first time that, that was the freak snowstorm and then the second time I have, again, three little kids and stomach virus was making its way um, around our family. So it was better that I didn't go. <laughs> better for all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, and then COVID. But I'm glad that we are uh, able to have the meeting this way. I feel like I've become like a Zoom, like I'm getting used to this now, you know, seeing, uh, seeing all the little faces um, while I give presentations. It's a little strange just sitting in my house talking to myself, it feels like, but um, you know, and I, I won't be able to tell if you're laughing at my jokes or not, uh, but I'll laugh at them. <laughs> so, um, so Chris mentioned I am a Birds and Beans um, voice for the birds. And if, uh, if you haven't tried the Birds and Beans coffee yet, it's very, very good. And um, shade grown bird friendly coffee is a great way uh, that we can conserve our you know, migratory birds uh, without doing very much just by buying the shade, the shade grown bird friendly coffee. Um, we can help provide habitat for birds like wood thrush um, and American red start Cerulean warbler, one of my favorites, uh, broad-winged hawks, um, well, you know, can be found uh, using shade-grown coffee plantations also. And uh, in Central and South America, uh, you can find turkey vultures and black vultures kind of in the air everywhere, certainly above shade-grown coffee, although they're not using the coffee plants the same way that our songbirds are. But that's a good segue into talking about my favorite bird, um, the turkey vulture. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and hopefully it will work properly. Um, let me do, 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 so you can all see that. Yep, perfect. Okay. All right, excellent. So uh, the title of my book, Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird, uh, even though of course, of course uh, vultures aren't unloved by everyone. They do have some friends who love them. Uh, other alternate titles were um, Vulture, Eat Your Heart Out, uh, or, or uh, Vulture, Happy Entrails to You. Um, but we went with uh, Private Life of an Unloved Bird um, instead of those other options. Um, but this, this uh, picture that I like to start with is a turkey vulture, and it was taken at um, Boyce Thompson Arboretum State Park in Arizona. Uh, if any of you have ever been there, it's a really amazing place to go to go birding. If you ever get out to Arizona to do any birding, um, it's a great spot. It's about an hour from Phoenix. And they have two vulture festivals every year. Um, one is the Bye Bye Buzzards Festival um, that happens in September. Uh, and the other is the Welcome Back Buzzards Festival that happens in, in March. And I've been to both. <laughs> um, and it's a fun celebration of uh, everybody's favorite bird, you know, the turkey vulture. Um, so the word buzzard, I should mention, uh, is a term that often in the US gets used interchangeably with vulture. But um, 
technically a buzzard is the common name for uh, an old world hawk in the Buteo family. So in the UK, um, you might refer to a red-tailed hawk as a red-tailed buzzard. Um, and there's a common buzzard and an auger buzzard uh, and some other buzzards in the old world that are, are hawks, not vultures. Uh, I don't think anybody's quite sure why we call North American uh, vultures buzzards, other than maybe folks from Europe um, came here, saw big dark birds flying and said they're buzzards because that's likely what they would have been um, in Europe. Um, anyway, uh, so the first couple, uh oh, hold on here, there we go. Um, the first few slides have a lot of words, um, but after that it's mostly pictures. I figure I get the words out early on while everybody's still, you know, I haven't put you to sleep yet. Um, but the big picture about vultures, so uh, worldwide there are 23 species, 16 in the old world, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and seven in North and South America. Uh, these old world and new world vultures are probably not very closely related. The old world vultures likely share a common ancestor with eagles and hawks, and the new world vultures um, were not, the origins are less clear about uh, who, who they're related to. They were traditionally um, lumped together with raptors because they look sort of like raptors and they eat meat. Uh, and then in the then the 1990s, they were taken out of raptors and put with storks. Uh, and now, more recently, they've been kind of put back with raptors again, um, kind of in their own group. Uh, but whatever the case, wherever you put New World vultures, they're probably not very closely related to Old World vultures, even though um, they do a lot of the same uh, things. They fill a lot of the same roles um, in the ecosystem. Uh, worldwide, they're not doing very well. Um, 11 of those 16 old world vultures um, are endangered and eight are considered critically endangered. Uh, and then here in the North America, our California condor, of course, is critically endangered. And if any of you have been following the news about the fires in the West, the Big Sur uh, condor sanctuary burned to the ground <laughs> pretty much. Um, if you follow, if you look at um, Ventana's Wildlife Society, if you find their web page or find them on Facebook, they had uh, five condor chicks in nests in that condor sanctuary and they lost two of the nestling California condors to the fires. Um, but uh, so there are our critically endangered um, vulture species. So worldwide, the threats are similar. Uh, threats include poisoning from lead, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, also, uh, poison that's not necessarily meant for vultures, but might be meant for other animals. And vultures are the um, unintended victims. Sometimes they are intentionally poisoned, though, in some parts of the world. Um, electrocution is a problem for a lot of big birds flying into power lines, getting electrocuted and dying. And vultures have. Uh, there are some belief-based killings of vultures, especially in some parts of Africa. There are some beliefs that vulture parts, there's a kind of a black market for vulture parts. Um, like that uh, one belief is that vulture, vulture brains, um, smoking vulture brains like in a pipe would give you a kind of a clairvoyant ability to like pick lottery numbers because vultures some, sometimes seem to just appear over a carcass as if they have a, you know, a second, a, a, some kind of intuition. I don't know if it works or not, I've not tried it, but uh, these belief-based um, poaching of vultures is a problem in some parts of the world where vultures are very crit critically endangered. Uh, one of these amazing African vultures, uh, this is the lappet-faced vulture. Um, this is not my photos, I just found some really nice uh, most of the photos are mine, except the really nice ones aren't. Uh, this is a lappet faced vulture from Africa, a uh, very large species of vulture um, that, you know, can open up those big carcasses with that, that really strong, really strong beak. Um, this is another very beautiful vulture, I think, the um, griffin vulture. Uh, 
just an amazing, a lot of people think that vultures are, are ugly and they're often very beautiful. Um, this is another old world species. And this is probably my, probably my favorite vulture, although it's tough to pick one. Um, if we were alive, if we were at a real presentation, I would ask if anybody knew who this, what bird this is. Um, this is the bearded vulture that used to be called, it still is called often the lammergeier, which means the lamb eating vulture, but they don't really eat lambs um, unless they're very, very dead. Uh, and, they, and then they eat their bones, which is what this bird has in its beak. It's a bone. Um, bearded vultures, their diet is uh, primarily bones, bone marrow. So they are the, one of the last birds to get to the carcass. If you think about you know, different species of vulture coming into a carcass at different times, um, this, is, this guy gets the last parts, the bones, and they will often hold them, fly up high, and then drop a bone onto, the, onto rocks to crack it open to get the marrow out of the inside. Um, but just a really amazing bird. And then coming over to um, our side of the world, uh, some of you, if you've been birding ever in Costa Rica, Central America, um, you might recognize this beautiful guy as the king vulture, um, which is just an amazing, uh, a sh you know, shocking, shockingly colorful scavenger, right? With these amazing purples and um, oranges and yellows and everything, just, and of course, these beautiful white feathers, um, just an amazing bird. And then here is our friend, uh, the California condor. Um, they've got this kind of spiky amazing feathers around their necks like they're wearing a big you know a big fur coat with a with a big fuzzy collar and they can um, puff their faces up uh, they've got that beautiful pink skin and those awesome red eyes that are really neat um, if any of you have not seen a condor in the wild uh, the vermilion cliffs in northern arizona are an excellent place to go and see california condors um, it's one of the places where they release the condors back to the wild after they've been in medical treatment um, or when they release young ones. And there's a condor viewing station. It's a little bit out of the way, but it's a great spot to see condors. I, I saw five when I was there, which was really, really cool. Um, so coming back to this big picture stuff, even though uh, there's, there's, they're a diverse group, I mean, they look different. Um, they're not, again, the New World and Old World, not closely related, but everywhere you go, they're primarily scavengers. Um, they have strong stomach acid and gut flora that allows them to eat diseases and neutralize dangerous pathogens, rabies, anthrax, botulism, toxin, uh, almost anything you could imagine, um, vultures can eat and neutralize it. Turkey vultures in particular have a gastric pH of almost zero. Uh, which is more acidic than car battery acid. Um, and they have two species of flesh eating bacteria in their guts that, and the, the combination of that gastric pH and this, these flesh eating bacteria really fries everything that goes through their digestive system. Uh, and there's often no trace even of the DNA of what they've eaten in their droppings. So if you need to get rid of a body ever, um, turkey vulture, you know, might be a great way to do that because they'll you know, they won't, they, they'll get rid of it all. Um, so vultures, again, worldwide, um, they quickly and efficiently remove carcasses that might otherwise contaminate the water, the soil, and the air. Um, they're pretty fast. Uh, and removing carcasses quickly also reduces the number and the concentration of mammalian scavengers around a carcass. Um, mammalian scavengers all sharing the same uh, food source might um, swap bacteria or swap saliva, and that's one way that rabies is potentially spread. Um, and it seems like, you know, even uh, even in the present day, you know, rabies we still get um, outbreaks of rabies. I think two two summers ago here, where I live in Morgantown, West Virginia, we had um, quite a few rabid raccoons um, and cats, um, unowned cats that were found to have rabies in my county. Uh, but having vultures reduces the number and concentration of those mammals. So they can eat disease and they can also help stop the spread of disease by getting rid of those carcasses. Uh, turkey vulture, so it's my favorite species and it's also the, the most abundant that we have here where I live in West Virginia. Um, 
there's some disagreement about whether there are more turkey vultures or whether there are more black vultures in the world. Um, but the turkey vulture is, is the most widespread. So it's got, it's got the biggest range. Um, and they're, they're, the turkey vulture people uh, say there are more turkey vultures. I think the black vulture people say there are more individual black vultures. But whatever the case, there are uh, lots and lots of both of those species. Turkey vultures um, breed from southern Canada uh, to the tip of Argentina and almost everywhere in between. Grasslands, coastlines, um, mountains, deserts. I mean, turkey vultures have a very, very uh, wide habitat, different kind of habitats. Um, there might be 15 to 20 million individual turkey vultures. Um, and again, the numbers are very similar for black vultures. Uh, that's a lot of birds. If you think about a bird like the cerulean warbler, um, there, there may be about you know, 300,000. So compare that to you know, 20 million turkey vultures. Uh, I mean, you've got a lot, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of scavengers. Uh, there are six subspecies of turkey vulture, and we have three that breed in North America, and then there are three that breed in the tropics. And different populations have different migratory strategies, which is kind of fascinating. You think again of a bird like the cerulean warbler or broadwing hawks, you know, we're in broadwing hawk migration time right now. Uh, I usually imagine the whole population shuttling from one spot to another spot and, uh, and then coming back one spot to another spot. Um, whereas turkey vultures though, you've got Eastern birds doing one kind of migration, birds in the upper Midwest doing something different, and then birds in the Southwest doing yet something else different. So it's, it's really uh, kind of neat, they're quite different. So this is the, this is the map that um, Cornell, uh, the current Cornell map for turkey vultures um, in North America. The purple is year round and the orange is, is breeding. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, you know, right in the middle of the US there, uh, if there just aren't surveys done or, or there aren't records of nests. Um, but you can see they're, they're almost over the entire, the entire country. And then this is the worldwide range map. They are, you can see all throughout South America. They're even on, um, again, islands, the Caribbean islands, the Falkland islands, uh, they are, they are nearly everywhere. So this is one of my favorite, my favorite uh, books and one of my favorite quotes about turkey vultures from Desert Solitaire. Let us praise the noble turkey vulture. No one envies him. He harms nobody and he contemplates our little world from a most serene and noble height. <laughs> and this is the view that most of us uh, see of turkey vultures while we're out bird watching. Um, the undersides of the wings and tail are light. Um, they have this relatively long, thin tail, and I always remember that turkey vultures have silver linings under their wings. Um, and if you see the bird like that with the silver all under the wings, um, you're looking at a turkey vulture. They certainly get mistaken for eagles um, very often. I've had friends say to me, um, oh, Katie, I know you like birds. I saw, you know, five or six golden eagles all circling together. It was amazing. Um, and I say, oh, that sounds like turkey vultures. No, no, these were beautiful. These were beautiful. They had to be eagles. <laughs> um, but uh, if you've got that silver lining, you're looking at turkey vultures. Up close, they're even more handsome, right? Um, this is this particular turkey vulture is named Lou and uh, Chris mentioned in my um, in the introduction that um, I work with an organization called the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, which is a mouthful. We usually just say um, ACCA and we rehab uh, all species of migratory birds and we have um, two turkey vultures and a black vulture who can't be returned to the wild um, because of their injuries. And this is one of them, um, Lou, and he's a great uh, subject for my photographs. So turkey vultures, they weigh about four pounds here in the eastern U.S. The ones in the upper Midwest are a little heavier. The ones in the southwest um, are a little lighter. They've got a five to six foot wingspan. So that's, it is similar to, to a bald eagle. Uh, but again, the birds weigh a lot less. Um, a turkey vulture, again, only weighs four pounds, or a bald eagle might weigh, you know, 10, 10 to 12 pounds. 
Um, they've got these brown black feathers that are iridescent depending on how the light hits them. And something important about turkey vultures is they've got these chicken feet. You can see that Lou is standing here on this log. Um, they don't have the really sharp curved talons um, of you know hawks or owls. Uh, they've got flat feet very much like a chicken. Um, they're not meant for grabbing, carrying anything away. Um, they might use them, they you know, stand on something dead and, and reach down and tear chunks off, um, but they don't have these toes that grip very well. Um, up close, uh, here's this very handsome, um, very handsome character. This is a bird that uh, somebody was driving home from work and came around a corner and thought he hit a turkey vulture with his truck, but uh, he pulled over and he couldn't find the turkey vulture anywhere, so he went home, went to bed, uh, and the next morning he came out and this bird was standing in the back of his truck um, and uh, he wasn't sure what to do with it, so he squirted it with a hose to get it out of the truck, and he was afraid of the bird. He went to work, but he came back that evening, and the bird was still um, in his yard. So uh, he did what anybody would do, which is put it on Facebook, right? <laughs> and um, the bird uh, eventually made its way to us for rehab. Um, the bird was not badly injured, thankfully, and we were able to... Uh, fix him up and return him to the wild um, just after a couple weeks of his, after his road rash healed. But if you take a close look at this bird's face, um, you notice a couple things. And uh, one of them that probably stands out most is the nose, the nostril. They've got this deviated septum. So you can see straight through, like you can put a little ring right in there. Um, you can see straight through the other side. Uh, turkey vultures have a, a very good sense of smell that they use in addition to their excellent eyesight to find food. Um, and it's been demonstrated that they you know, use both of those senses when they're finding something dead um, to eat. And other birds know that turkey vultures are very good at finding dead things. And other bird species will sometimes follow turkey vultures to food and then displace them <laughs> at a carcass. So turkey vultures often find it first, but then sometimes get um, chased away by eagles or hawks um, or black vultures. Uh, in the tropics, it can be a little bit different um, because the northern turkey vultures, the migrants, when they come to the tropics, they're a lot bigger than the tropical black vultures and the tropical turkey vultures. So they will sometimes displace those species. But here in North America, Turkey vulture often finds it first and then gets often or sometimes chased away by um, more enthusiastic feeders, but they use that sense of smell to find their food. Um, if you can look at this bird's, well, first he's got this beautiful curved, like a crochet hook beak, right, for tearing chunks off of dead things. And they can open their mouths very, very wide to swallow these chunks. Um, a turkey vulture can, you know, swallow something probably the size of, almost the size of my hand, uh, just by, you know, opening that mouth very, very wide and swallowing the chunks. Um, if you can see it, if you can look close, if you can see its tongue, uh, there are little serrations on the tongue. And the idea is that those serrations help, help the bird hold onto and swallow like slippery gross organs, uh, which is the good stuff, right? The nutritious stuff. But that those serrations on the tongue might help help them. They don't have, you know, teeth or hands. Uh, so that those serrations might help them swallow that slippery, um, yummy stuff. Uh, you also might notice that there's not many feathers on their on their faces. That's true of a lot of vulture species worldwide. Um, they put their uh, they put their heads into dead things. Um, people will sometimes say, you know, oh, Katie, those birds you like are, are really ugly. They don't have any feathers on their heads. And I say, well, think about how ugly they would be if they had, you know, bunches of dead rotting stuff all stuck to their faces. So uh, having no feathers on your face helps you kind of helps you keep, keep yourself clean. Something interesting too, um, this, you can see those white warty things uh, around the eyes of this bird. So I've read some people um, claim kind of, I think anecdotally, that, that birds get more of those as they age. 
However, I'm not sure if that is 100% true. Um, our two captive turkey vultures uh, that both came into rehab when they were about a year old, uh, neither one has developed these on their faces. And the birds in the tropics apparently don't have these warty protrusions on their faces either. So uh, maybe it's something that they're getting from what they're eating. Um, I'm not really sure, but it's, it's interesting that um, our captive birds don't have them and the birds in the tropics don't have them either. Uh, so it's kind of a, a mystery that I would like to figure out. Okay, so moving on from that handsome face, um, turkey vultures are considered obligate scavengers. So they eat dead things. Um, they're not, if they, uh, if they, they're not, um, they have to eat dead things. Um, they're not equipped to eat live things. Uh, the scientific literature on turkey vultures eating live things, people have tried to document it frequently, and there are very, very few cases of them, uh, you know, swallowing small fish that maybe have washed up on a beach that aren't quite dead yet. They might walk up to them and swallow. Um, there are a couple instances of nestling birds that can't, you know, that are very small and can't move that turkey vultures might walk up to and swallow. Some invertebrates like uh, insects that aren't quite dead yet. Um, but uh, it's, it's nearly, nearly 100% carrion um, dead things. Uh, they do um, learn where reliable sources of carrion happen. Uh, so they will learn where they are able to find their food. Um, they probably don't, you know, encourage rabbits to get run over by cars, but if there's a certain part of the road where maybe things get hit often, um, you might notice that vultures might kind of uh, hang out in that area. Um, or if there is a farm uh, where carcasses are disposed of on the farm, or if there's um, uh, an area where, um, you know, the folks from the highway maybe put dead deer, roadkill deer, the vultures will learn where that is and hang out near it. Um, there are a lot of good comics about, about, speaking of comics, about vultures. This is one of my favorite that you may have seen before. I am a turkey vulture. Yes, indeed. My head is bare to prevent rotting flesh from adhering to it. To keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet. So to pause there for a minute, I had some interesting discussions with my, the editor of my book about, about how to describe this. Um, uh, you can't really say that vultures urinate um, because it's not really urine. There's some urea, some, some you know, uric acid, uh, but it's not really urine. Um, so I think we actually phrased it, they expel liquid waste onto their legs and feet. And it's, um, it's called urohydrosis. Uh, we usually call it an accident, you know, in my house, but it's a, uh, it's called urohydrosis. Other species do it as well. Um, storks do this, um, other vulture species. But it's, it's interesting. Uh, so it's like hand sanitizer too, um, because it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's supposedly can help kill bacteria on the feet um, of the vultures. Although I think that that is something that, um, I don't know that we're 100% sure, but that's one of the theories about, uh, in addition to keeping cool, why they might do that. Um, my main defense is projectile vomiting, um, which is also true. Uh, if you think about turkey vultures have very little defense other than flying away. Um, they don't have sharp, strong talons. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they don't get in fights um, very often. Um, but if they have, if there are predators that might be threatening turkey vultures, it would normally be at a nest if it's going to happen. The nesting is, is uh, vulnerable. Um, turkey vultures will often just nest in caves, uh, uh, very big um, hollow trees, uh, haylofts, sometimes right on the ground. So the chicks, as the chicks get older, they're left for long periods of time. So they're, they're vulnerable. Uh, but that vomit is very um, strong smelling and kind of horrible if it gets in your car or in your clothes. Um, it's a really hard smell to get out. So humans would definitely be um, dissuaded, you know, by vulture vomit. Uh, if you are a raccoon though, or a coyote, 
and you are coming up on a turkey vulture nest and a young turkey vulture vomited, um, roadkill deer, uh, you might eat that instead of bothering the young turkey vulture. Um, I have a beagle who would definitely eat turkey vulture vomit, you know, if given the chance. So um, it works to, you know, maybe, maybe scare people, humans away, but it also might provide an easy meal to something like a raccoon. Um, and then on the bottom, you know, I am so awesome, which of course they are. Um, I just mentioned nesting. This is a turkey vulture in a nest. Um, this is a cave, and this is in western Pennsylvania. Caves and cliffs are very popular nest sites for turkey vultures, um, and California condors also, and um, vulture species in other parts of the world too, and in the old world often will nest on caves and cliffs. So this these babies are this um it's very dark very far back in the cave and i actually stuck my camera in and took a picture without even really being able to see what i was taking a picture of and this is what uh you know with the flash um so they don't build a nest they might move some leaves around but turkey vultures aren't able to carry anything back to a nest to build it they don't have again they don't have feet to carry sticks um, they can't carry anything very large in their in their beaks um, for any long period of time. So they might kick around some of the leaves to make a spot to lay an egg, but they don't build um, build a nest. Uh, these are turkey vultures in a hayloft um, in a in a Pennsylvania barn. They're really cute, right? I hope all of you watching just went oh, um, because they are uh, they are very cute little guys. Um, if you notice on the lower right hand of your screen, you might be able to see some kind of reddish brown lumps. That's vomit meant for me um, because I was bothering these birds by going in their nests and they threw up. So baby turkey vulture vomit is um, twice as bad as adult turkey vulture vomit because it's twice partially digested. So if you remember, the adults can't really carry anything back to the nest, so they eat the dead thing, they fill up their crop, the adult fills up their crop, flies back to the nest and then regurgitates for the babies to eat. The babies eat it and then somebody bothers them at the nest and they throw it up again. So it's again, twice partially digested roadkill. So <laughs> it's pretty smelly. Uh, but these birds in this hayloft um, have the whole run of the hayloft um, to wander around. This is in a barn that the farmer doesn't use anymore. Uh, but he leaves for the turkey vultures. He loves having them in the barn um, and he tries not to bother them uh, at the nest. So um, this is another adorable baby turkey vulture. And this is one that we've taken out of the nest. So of course it's illegal to mess with migratory birds. They're protected um, at their nests. This uh, particular project that um, my small ACCA organization is part of. We partner with West Virginia University, USGS, um, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, and we uh, take babies out of the nest for a few minutes from known nests. We've been doing this for eight or nine years now. Um, we measure the babies, um, take various different measurements, um, put a wing tag on them that I'll show you a picture of in a minute, and take a blood sample. Um, before I talk about the blood sample, um, look at this guy's face and think about the face of that other turkey vulture that I had out a couple minutes ago. Um, you can notice that this bird's the face skin is gray, um, not red, which can be a little bit confusing if you're looking at a uh, black vultures also have gray faces. Turkey vultures don't really get that red face until they're at least a year old. Um, the end of their beak too is black when they're babies and it's sort of fades to white um, over the course of the first year or so of their lives. Um, they also have these beautiful blue eyes when they're babies, you know, not unlike Frank Sinatra. Um, somebody at a presentation uh, once said that this looks like Bernie Sanders. Um, and now, now I can't unsee, unsee it whenever <laughs> I look at this picture. <laughs> um, but uh, and also would notice in this picture and in the last one that uh, turkey vultures have white down feathers, um, which is important because baby black vultures look a lot like baby turkey vultures, except baby black vultures have kind of buffy down feathers. 
kind of brown down feathers where turkey vultures have these white down feathers. So uh, the research that we're doing is in contaminants. So we're, we, we're looking for lead um, in their blood, the blood samples. And this picture is a baby turkey vulture in a baby scale. And that uh, piece of equipment behind the bird is called the Lead Care 2 kit, which is a point of care um, field test kit uh, that you can take a blood sample, put it into this machine, and it gives you a reading uh, in about a minute or two um, that can tell you how much lead is in uh, the bird's blood. So lead is a huge problem for the California condors. A lot of you probably know that, that um, lead is the biggest hurdle to the uh, California condors' um, success. They're susceptible to lead toxicity. Uh, bald eagles, um, golden eagles, red-tailed hawks, uh, red-shouldered hawks, crows, ravens, these are all species that um, can get very sick or even die from eating a small amount of lead. Turkey vultures, however, and black vultures can handle a lot more lead than uh, other species. Um, so measuring the lead in the blood of baby turkey vultures, um, you can get a sense of how much lead is out in the ecosystem. Where if you have a bald eagle, uh, it only has to eat a tiny piece of lead for it to become very sick. So you don't really know how much lead is out there because you've got a sick bird and it's dying. Whereas turkey vultures, they can handle um, a lot of lead and still function. So it can give you a sense of how much lead is out there in the environment. Uh, people have asked, or you might be asking, you know, where do they get the lead? Um, well, there are uh, different, different sources for lead. Um, I'll show you this picture is um, taking a blood sample. Um, that's my husband, Jesse, and one of our volunteers, um, Amanda, who is now um, a veterinary student in California. We're very proud of her. Um, but this taking um, a blood sample, uh, from this turkey vulture. And I'm going to put on the bottom of the screen, if anybody wants to read more about this, is that you could do a whole presentation just on lead in scavengers. There's a paper that came out a couple years ago called Chronic Lead Exposure is Epidemic in Obligate Scavenger Populations in Eastern North America. Uh, and it was a study that uh, my husband, Jesse, and a few of our colleagues um, authored. We, we uh, got about 100 dead black vultures and turkey vultures that were killed um, by the USDA for being nuisance vultures that were roosting somewhere that was interfering with something. And they took blood samples, but they also took samples of the lead in the bones of the bird. Blood cycles through quickly, but lead deposits in the bones. I believe they looked at the femurs of the dead vultures uh, for evidence of chronic lead exposure. And the study found that 100% of the birds had evidence of chronic lead exposure. Um, they ran um, isotopic tests to try to determine the source of the lead, which is not, it's not always accurate, but it can give you a, a pretty good idea of where the lead came from. And the two biggest contributors for lead in those vultures was spent ammunition. So the birds eating a gut pile which if you are a scavenger and you come across, you know, a deer hunter's gut pile, that's amazing. That's like a, a wonderful treat. Someone has killed this deer and left the good parts for us. <laughs> um, so if you think about a regular natural system where the big predator comes in, um, kills, kills the uh, prey, takes what it wants, and then leaves the rest for the scavengers, that's what's happening. So it's good, um, except uh, scavenging birds might inadvertently swallow um, pieces of uh, lead that are left in the left in the gut pile and they can get sick. The other the other source of lead in this population was um, uh, coal-fired power plant emissions. Uh, and then I think there was a third smaller uh, source of lead, um, smelting plant emissions. Um, but anyway, so our blood samples um, we test for lead. Uh, that's, uh, I believe, the only thing we test for right now, but we have um, some blood banked. Oh, okay, and I've put pictures of my children in case you hear them shouting in the background. I figured this would be endearing. <laughs> um, but these are my two of my daughters uh, helping out 
um, with these baby turkey vultures. Um, and there I am making my oldest daughter take notes for us. Um, that's appropriate field attire for any young biologist. Your pink dress and your, your flip flops. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned wing tags. So uh, a lot of birds, if you're going to tag them, um, you put you might put a metal leg band on. If you're going to band songbirds, you put the metal leg band with the unique number. Uh, turkey vultures and California condors and other vulture species, um, you can't really put a metal leg band on safely for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that the, the leg band can become caked with that liquid waste that the birds um, expel onto their legs and it will make it unable, unable to read the number and it can also kind of get, just get caked on there and hurt the bird. So these wing tags um, are what biologists use to uh, mark vultures and other large birds. Uh, it's sort of a cattle ear, ear tag. It's very similar, it's floppy. So when I first saw these tags that we were gonna put on these baby turkey vultures, I was very concerned because I'm like a vulture hugger. And uh, I was told that these are actually the same, very same tags, very similar tags that they use for California condors. And before they put them on California condors, they tested them extensively on turkey vultures to make sure they wouldn't cause any problems. So it goes, it goes over uh, a tendon and through a very thin, thin piece of skin and it gets uh, like pierced like an earring. So, and then also you can identify the bird from the ground, um, which is, is really neat if you're a bird watcher, you can just be looking at vultures through your binoculars and read that tag. So this is a bird that was tagged in Avella, Pennsylvania, right on the West Virginia border um, in 2016. And this bird was recited in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, the following spring. So, you know, this our baby turkey vulture from Avella, you know, made it all the way to uh, West Palm Beach before it was a year old. And this is the, and a bird watcher saw this and reported it to the Federal Bird Banding Laboratory. And then the Bird Banding Laboratory um, got in touch with us. Uh, and we were able to communicate directly with the bird watcher who saw the bird. Um, and he said the bird was uh, feeding with other vultures and it was unremarkable other than the fact that it was wearing a wing tag. Um, so we were, we were just pretty amazed, uh, pretty amazed about that. I asked, you know, was it at Mar-a-Lago? Um, but it was not, it was not. It was at a wildlife management area. Uh, and then this is a turkey vulture that we were able to, uh, had a donor donate a transmitter to us. Um, this is a turkey vulture that came into rehab in West Virginia. It was a bird that was shot with a shotgun pellets. Um, she was released with shotgun pellets still in her body because it would have caused more damage to try to take them out than it would be to just leave them in. Um, we didn't put a wing tag on this bird because we didn't want to give her, she had already had a, a wing injury, so we didn't want to give her any extra weight. Um, but we felt it was safe to put this transmitter on. The transmitter is solar powered and it uses cell phone towers to track the birds. So when the turkey vulture, um, I'm, I think it's more complicated than this, but as I understand it, when the bird flies by a cell phone tower, it sort of makes a call um, or pings the tower. And then that gets sent back to the researchers who can figure out the bird's movements. So uh, if any of you work in wildlife rehab, it's always nerve wracking when you're going to be able to release a bird and track it. Um, because, you know, what if it just goes out and dies right away? Um, you know, what if, what if you're really not doing any good? So I was nervous when we released this bird. Uh, but check this out. This is the only bird I know of from West Virginia that was wearing a transmitter. So the map on the left, the, the star is where we released it in Morgantown. And then you can see by looking at the dots, this bird went all the way to northern Georgia and back twice. Um, and it roughly follows, you know, the Shenandoah Valley, Interstate 81. <laughs> uh, and I used to live um, in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is the bird flew right over a couple times, um, which is really amazing um, that we got this data. And also interestingly, when the bird came back to West Virginia, this map on the right, the kind of zoomed in map, the star is where we released the bird, but that 
yellow dot or the yellow dot with the black dot in the middle, um, that was that's the area she came back to. And you can see the points are clustered around that area and that's where she was shot. So she went back to the area where she was from, even though she was released in Morgantown. So we haven't had any data from her since the fall of 2016. She was released in 2014. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that she has died. Uh, also in the fall of 2016, um, AT&T shut down their 2G cell towers, I guess, and somehow this could have affected the, the transmissions from this bird. So she has like a, an old cell phone right now, I guess, and the other turkey vultures make fun of her. Uh, but we don't have any way of finding her now and taking it off, even if it um, has malfunctioned or, or if we can't upgrade her cell phone, um, unfortunately. So she might still be out there, even if she's not, that's still two years of eating carrion along Interstate 81. Um, that she that she wouldn't have had otherwise. So I think in this sense, the rehab was good. It worked. <laughs> uh, this is a map from Hawk Mountain. This is a bird named Leo um, who nests in uh, central Saskatchewan. That red dot there is um, near, right near Leoville. And this is one of the northernmost turkey vulture nests uh, that that has that we know of. Um, Leo is the female turkey vulture. They put the transmitter on her in 2007 at the nest site. And as far as I know, it's still transmitting. Um, her mate also wears a transmitter. And the, the pair has been together since 2007 when they put the transmitters on. Interestingly, um, they, they go to different places in the winter. So the female goes to the same place in Venezuela every winter, but the male goes further. This is just the female's map. The male goes further into Colombia. So they sort of have separate winter vacations. Um, it's maybe why they're together still right after all this time. Uh, Leo's transmitter um, did stop working at some point um, and the, the biologists from Hawk Mountain had to recapture her and fix her transmitter and then release her again. Um, so the, these birds, this is a different subspecies. These, the eastern turkey vultures, the farthest our birds go was Florida, um, and then they come back, but some, like the bird from West Virginia, might only go to Georgia and come back, and some might stay around the coast all year. Uh, but the upper Midwestern turkey vultures are considered complete migrants. The ones from, again, upper Midwest Canada go all the way to the tropics. Some of them might stop in Arizona um, or Mexico, uh, but they all leave where they are in the north. And then this other subspecies, the southwestern subspecies, which is the smallest one in North America, they're similar to the eastern turkey vultures in that they don't go very far. Uh, they might go into, you know, southern Mexico and come back. Um, but most of them don't cross the Panama Canal. Most of them from the southwest will stay um, in between uh, Arizona, Mexico area, but s some might stay um, in southern Arizona all year. Okay, and I got to talk about this guy for just a couple minutes here. Um, our other our other vulture species in the eastern U.S. Um, another one of my favorite species, um, the black vulture, of course. Um, and uh, similar to turkey vultures in a lot of ways, but different in some ways too. They've got a gray featherless head. Whereas turkey vultures, you know, adults have that red head. Um, black vultures look like they have um, white hands on the ends of their wings. Uh, so if you see them flying, they look like they kind of are wearing white gloves and they have shorter tails than turkey vultures, but they still have these chicken feet. So black vultures um, also don't have feet that allow them to pick up anything and carry it away. So just like turkey vultures, they're nesting in cliffs, um, on the ground, uh, you know, even in abandoned cars, um, deer tree stands, uh, they're not building any nests, they're not carrying food back to a nest, they still have chicken feet um, that are not, um, not able to pick up things and carry them. Uh, in flight, um, this picture you know, is not, this is not my picture, it's a great one. Though. The one on the top is a black vulture and the one on the bottom is a turkey vulture and you can see how that, uh, the white hands and the silver lining on the turkey vulture that are pretty obvious differences. 
Although they can look alike when you see them, a big dark bird in the sky, it can sometimes take a minute to see what you're looking at. Um, black vultures uh, and turkey vultures too, they're both species are showing up further and further north on Christmas bird counts than, than they have recently. Um, there are a couple different reasons for that. One is possibly that the world is getting warmer. Um, both turkey vultures and black vultures probably originated in the tropics and pushed forward uh, over millions of years. Um, so getting out of the cold is pretty important for both species. Uh, but we still now, but we do have black vultures again showing up further and further north on Christmas bird counts than they have been in the past. Uh, and turkey vultures also. Um, but still, the vast majority um, of black vultures are in the tropics. And the estimates I have read say about 10% of the world's black vultures are in North America and about 90% are in the tropics. And for turkey vultures, uh, it's about 30% are in North America and 70% are in the tropics. So both species are, you know, tropical species at heart um, that has uh, kind of pushed, pushed, pushed north. Um, this is another, you know, vulture comic. Uh, you know, the <laughs> sort of these vultures are sort of, um, you know, happy that the that the uh, yeah, good news on the climate change bill, the oil lobbyists won, um, which is, uh, you know, not that funny, but um, vultures are almost never in funny comics. But it's uh, possible that's one reason that, that vultures are pushing further north is because we're getting warmer. Um, it could also be that because uh, we have highways, we have these big interstates that serve up, you know, it's like a buffet table for vultures, so serve up dead food, um, you know, all year long, and interstates, the roadways often stay warmer than the surrounding areas. Uh, warm air rises, so these highways provide somewhere for the birds to fly easily, where they don't have to expend a lot of energy, and they supply food. So our interstates are, you know, great. Vultures, turkey vultures, and black vultures are two species that really have done a great job taking advantage of human, uh, human habitations, you know, human habits. Um, both species will also uh, eat things like um, from dumpsters, like old meat from dumpsters, um, cat or dog food that's been left outside. Uh, they'll even eat things like pumpkins or rotting vegetables that are left in a field. Uh, sometimes people won't realize that vultures can go into trash and eat what's in the trash. Um, and they, they, they can do that and they've done that in some areas. Uh, you know, they, they, they sort of clean up, clean up the stuff that other people leave behind. Uh-oh, where's my... So black vultures, their diet is carrion also, but they occasionally will eat weak animals. And even though their diet is, you know, almost exclusively carrion, uh, the eating weak animal part is where they get their terrible reputation from. <laughs> Um, they're opportunistic and they learn where to find reliable sources of food, you know, just like turkey vultures. Uh, they're reported in some locations to attack newborn um, or vulnerable livestock, although it doesn't happen everywhere. It's kind of a mystery. Uh, I, I believe the current theory is that this is a learned behavior within certain groups of black vultures uh, and isn't really something that they, it's something that they have to teach each other. Um, but livestock giving birth in a field or anything giving birth in a field, um, there's a lot of great possibilities if you're um, a scavenger. Um, you've got the afterbirth, which is you know yummy, I hear, and very nutritious, and there's no thick hide to go through. It's something you can eat very easily um, if you're a scavenger. And if, if uh, something is stillborn, um, or that, that's also easy food if you're a scavenger, um, and if and then these uh, rep reports of attacking newborn livestock that maybe are uh, can't can't get up or having some trouble and 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 if you get a lot of black vultures, um, they could eat something before it's uh, you know when it's not quite dead. And if you keep in mind the way that vultures they don't have feet to kill anything, so if they are going to eat something that's alive, they they basically 
eat it. Like they just start eating it with their beaks. <laughs> um, so it's gotta be something that can't really get out of the way. So, you know, keeping your very sick or very pregnant animals close to the barn um, will of course, you know, if they're inside a barn, um, I've interestingly heard about black vultures nesting in barns right, uh, right above goats um, and, and uh, sheep and things like that and not having any problem at all. So it's, it's a mystery sort of as why it happens some places and not others. Something else about turkey, now this is a lot of words. I promised you I wouldn't have too many words later, but I just wanted to uh, put this up here very quickly. A lot of people, at least where I live in West Virginia, now we've got black vultures. And there's this kind of a media frenzy sometimes about where are these birds coming from? You know, there are these new birds that have never been here before. But uh, John James Audubon in 1827, um, when he was writing about black vultures in his Birds of America, he noted that the bird is a constant resident in all of our southern states, um, extends far up the Mississippi, continues the whole year in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, even the state of Ohio, um, you know, along the Atlantic coast, rarely seen further east than Maryland. So it's not new, it's just a, but we probably didn't, didn't see them in these states for a hundred years for a variety of reasons. Um, one, uh, black vultures were affected by DDT, like bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and a lot of our large birds. Uh, they also were not protected by law until you know, the 1960s. So people shot lots of them. Uh, and then we, once they got protection, we stopped you know, using so many of those pesticides, the birds were uh, able to you know, come back to their historic range, but that seems new to people and um, scary because they're vultures. Also, I thought it was interesting that he said that Audubon notes that they're half domesticated in and about our cities, where it, uh, where it finds food without the necessity of using much exertion. So hundreds of them are usually found at all hours of the day about the slaughterhouses. They stand on the roofs and the chimney tops, et cetera, et cetera. So it's still what they get blamed. They, they still do that now, but now it's sometimes like, oh my gosh, these new things, why are they everywhere? They were everywhere and then they're they were gone and now they're just back. Uh, they're making use of human, you know, human habits. Uh, these are, th this is Mayaka River State Park near Sarasota, Florida that I took this picture. So I was pretty proud of it. Um, I watched these black vultures go around this picnic area, checking the grills for meat. You know, the big predator has come through, has prepared its meat and then has, uh, has, moved on and the vultures are there to clean up the leftovers. This, um, this, there's dead mice in here. So if you don't want to see dead mice, just look away. Um, but this, this is a uh, maverick, the black vulture who lives at the ACCA. It's just a really, really neat bird, not releasable. I was hit by a car. I have this little video in here just to show you kind of how they use their feet and how their feet are very chicken-like. Um, and how they have to stick their beaks inside carcasses to get pieces of, to rip chunks off. Um, and black vultures are, uh, at least in my experience, very curious, kind of smart birds. And we give this bird a lot of toys to play with um, because he does, he is very curious about new, uh, new things um, kind of in his, in his environment. Now, I cannot explain this behavior. My favorite color. Uh, let me turn that down. I can't really explain this behavior, but Maverick the Black Vulture also plays fetch. Um, and I have even seen footage of Black Vultures doing this. Now, this again, he's a captive bird. He's been with us for years. And he's got his lovely dish of, he's got um, little pieces of mice that we hide in there so he can not kind of knock the balls around to get the mice. But I've seen footage of Black Vultures doing this um, even uh, wild black vultures with soccer balls and stuff like that, that kids will leave on playgrounds. Uh, and it's, um, again, I can't, I can't quite explain it, but it's a really interesting behavior. And it's not, it's not something that you get to see every day. So I included these, um, included these videos. So I'm kind of getting to the end here. So, okay, you know, I get, we need vultures, right? And they're cute, um, but, you know, vultures are scary sometimes. People are often afraid of vultures. That says, wait up guys, here it is. Yep, we're good to go. He's an organ donor.
Um, and it's possibly that, you know, these birds wait around, remind us of death, uh, make us think that something is, something is waiting for me to die. Um, I've had a lot of people um, send me pictures like this and say, these birds are in my yard. Do they know something? You know, like, do I have to be afraid? Like, uh, are they, are they, are they going to come in my house and attack me? Like, are they waiting for me to die? This time of year is when a lot of the birds are kind of, the babies are leaving the nests in a lot of cases. Uh, turkey vultures are kind of grouping up, getting ready to sort of, getting ready to migrate. Black vultures are, you know, again, kind of coming together after the breeding season. So you have these roosts um, that function in uh, different ways. The birds can follow each other to food. Uh, the roosts are often warm. Um, if it's a, a good wind, if there's a location that has good wind, um, that might be a vulture roost also. And they can, there's a social aspect to a roost also, like following each other to food. They have done some genetic research on black vultures and determined that they roost with extended families. So that black vultures roosting together may be um, related, which I think is really pretty interesting. So some of the fears people have, you know, will vultures hurt my children? And, you know, only if they're dead, right? Um, generally, they prefer to eat dead herbivores uh, and deer, cattle, poultry. But there are really people who feel like vultures are stalking children. Um, and there are, you know, news clips where I saw a news clip of somebody saying, I don't want my child to get off the school bus here because there are vultures that are stalking the children getting off the school bus. And like, they aren't, there's probably, it's probably good wind um, or there's a lot of roadkill. Uh, this is my um, daughter who just turned six. Maverick the black vulture is like her, she calls him her buddy um, and she feeds him uh, not every day, but pretty often. Uh, and the bird runs up and eats food out of her hand and you know, he doesn't try to eat her. So, <laughs> um, also, are they waiting for me to die? You know, this is, this is, again, is something people say. And, and turkey vultures, you know, do not follow dying animals or people, despite the movies. Um, this is one of my favorite comics. For some reason, these new birds didn't seem as interested in William's birdseed. Um, but they, they look creepy, people will say often, too. And, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Bald is beautiful. Um, they, a lot of, you know, that's just a, uh, you know, label we put on it, creepy. Um, and then this, of course, is what we see in a lot of Western movies that we grew up watching, you know, um, these poor, this poor person, you know, dragging, dragging himself through the desert with these vultures just sort of waiting, waiting, you know, for him to die and no one helping him. Um, but if you ever find yourself, you know, in this situation, where you're crawling through the desert and you see vultures, just keep calm and carry on. Ah, oh. so there's a lot of good vulture jokes out there. Uh, but anyway, that is the getting, that's the end here. So um, if you have any questions about anything, um, I'm happy to answer them and I can stop sharing, or I guess I should show, that's my organization I've been mentioning. Um, if you want to see more vulture pictures or anything, you can follow us on Facebook. We have a website that's not very good, um, but I, we update our Facebook page uh, fairly often. Um, not just vulture pictures, uh, other birds too. So let me go ahead and, and um, stop sharing, I guess. Is that what I should do, Chris? Uh, yeah, why don't you do, go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay, there I am. So I, I can see why you might have been a little reluctant to do this over Zoom as opposed to in person. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of us were laughing out loud. I know I was at some of those. I love the cartoons. I'll, I'll put a plug in for <laughs> the Hawk Mountain shirt. No carcass left behind, but I love that. Keep yes. calm and carry on. <laughs> yes. On that. So I haven't seen any questions come in on the chat yet but you were talking about the different subspecies and you know I've seen I think I've only seen lesser yellow-headed vulture in the yeah. tropics uh, I think it was in Panama and you know they look just like a turkey vulture yes but it's not 
a subspecies of turkey vulture, is it? That, that's a whole complete different species. Yes, but they are, my understanding is that they are closely related and that the greater and lesser yellow-headed vultures uh, use their sense of smell um, also to find, to find food. So turkey vultures, to my knowledge, turkey vultures and greater and lesser yellow-headed vultures are uh, the three species that use that excellent sense of smell. Yeah, and they look remarkably like a turkey vulture. Just the color of the skin on their face is a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, we do have a couple questions coming in here. Um, <laughs> David Smith asks, why do vultures peel rubber strips from car windshields or wiper blades? That's such an excellent, that's an excellent question. I am not sure. Um, I've read different theories about why, um, but I really don't, I don't, I don't have an answer and I'm not sh if somebody has an answer, I haven't heard of it yet, but that's a fascinating thing. Um, so black vultures do that. And uh, I know young California condors will do something similar. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, I've heard, I've, I've heard some theories that it's just boredom that the birds are, you know, don't want to, if they're not hungry, uh, they don't want to fly because they don't want to use their energy um, or if they're so they will hang out and kind of loaf. Um, I've also heard that, you know, the rubber, uh, you know, might be similar to something that they would eat. Like it might be similar to viscera. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I can definitely tell you, though, that our that the videos I just showed our black vulture plays with um, a lot of a lot of toys a variety of things he will play with. He investigates everything, picks everything up. I've been in with him in my uh, sandal. I have, I have, I had sandals on one day and I had a rock in my sandal. So I kind of kicked off my sandal to get the rock out. And that bird ran over and grabbed my sandal. Um, <laughs> and like, like a puppy and picked it up and dropped it and picked it up and dropped it and ran around circles with it and like flapped his wings. And, and um, I don't, you know, I don't want to want to try to not anthropomorphize, but I'm not sure what what uh, how to explain the behavior. It's a uh, yeah, one of those mysteries that we just leave as a mystery, I guess. And I mean, a lot of intelligent bird species play with toys. Um, uh, I mean, I have a uh, I have a, a small parrot um, who destroys everything that she can, you know, that's within her reach. Um, we have a we have a crow at the at the ACCA also. Um, who also plays with a lot of toys, uh, and our, our turkey vultures um, are less interested in that than the uh, black vulture and the crow is crow are. But um, I don't. I wish I. I wish I knew the answer to that mystery of why black vultures do that. When Mike Mike Peduto said that crows do the same thing with car wipers, wind windshield wipers, and boredom and play is the explanation that he's heard. So yeah. Yeah, could be. Um, I, that's the explanation I've mostly heard too. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I I like to think of it as a sign of intelligence, I guess. But yeah, yeah, could be. Uh, we think they're kind of dumb doing that, and they're wondering why we think they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Lloyd Lewis said about thirty black vultures have taken up roosting in back of the Wise Grocery in Edgewater. Um, near the dumpsters <laughs> so probably why <laughs> yeah um diane asked do turkey vultures generally fly higher than black vultures uh i think it's typically the other way that black vultures will except during well i guess during migration um there aren't really black vultures where a lot of the you know upper western turkey vultures would be migrating, but I, I, my understanding is on a normal day, black vultures will get up higher than turkey vultures to follow them, mm. um, follow them to, to uh, carcasses. Okay. And uh, sort of about the flying high and, and eating and all that stuff. Um, so I guess it's sort of that, uh, that one subspecies that you showed that nests in Canada and the upper Midwest, those are the ones that really migrate far. Yes, those are the, yeah. I've heard that they can go like 30 days without eating during migration. Is that, 
Do you know if that's true? Uh, I know they don't eat very much during migration. Yes, that they they fly fast um, and they don't they don't stop to eat unless uh, if they sometimes might get slowed down by a, like a weather event. Mm. Um, but yeah, my understanding is that they they go um, and the turkey vultures in the east that do this partial migration that you know they might go to Georgia, they might go to Florida, they might might go to the Jersey Shore, that kind of thing. <laughs> they don't migrate very quickly at all. Um, they go at about a quarter of the speed that the birds from the upper Midwest travel. Okay. Well, I guess. They get, and they get to the tropics and they're very, very hungry. Okay. Um, okay. And they, uh, uh, and that they, you know, just like our warblers that fly across, you know, the Gulf of Mexico and then like crash and are really hungry um, mm -hmm. when they make landfall. I mean, turkey vultures are, when they get to that, you know, when they're, there are those complete migrants get to where they're going, they're, uh, they're hungry. They've lost a lot of their, a lot of their fat. Yeah. And they, they migrate. I, I actually was in um, Veracruz once and happened to be there when one of those river of raptors happened by. Oh, that's cool. Uh, it's just yeah. amazing. But lots of turkey vultures, uh, broad-winged hawks, white pelicans and hingas. Uh, but, you know, when you watch them do all these thermals, and they, they're hardly flapping at all. So yeah. I guess in theory, during migration, they can just get up in the morning on a thermal and just glide the whole day without much energy so I guess that would help explain why they don't have to eat yeah and and um they have put uh they've put um well a lot of I mean everything about how their how their their flight is um uh to not they don't want to expend much energy I mean they can't create their own meal mm -hmm. um so they don't want to expend much energy um I read about uh they put um like a heart monitor on flying turkey vultures and determine that their heart rate when they're soaring and not flapping is similar to the heart rate when they're sleeping. Wow. <laughs> okay. <That's> amazing. <laughs> that is. All right. Um, oh, Lynn says, we once saw peregrines playing with leftover sweet potatoes in a harvested field during a storm when multiple birds were grounded there. Oh, cool. That's like weird. Other Actually. Get their veggies in sometimes. Well, uh, so we'd given enrichment to a lot of our, well, all of our non-releasable birds at the ACCA and the peregrine plays with toys too. Uh, she will, we put, she's got a ball that has a bunch of holes in it that we put just like the one that the black vulture has that you'd put, uh, put her food inside and she'll get both feet on the ball and like, like she's doing ab exercises, you know, and she'll like roll, roll around on top of it and she will jump around her enclosure with the ball on one foot. Um, but some of the other birds, like our red-tailed hawk is not at all as interested and in, she, yeah. she just wants her food. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we've got a lot of comments about fantastic oh. presentation, great presentation. I, I concur with that. Uh, well, it, was, it was worth waiting three years for. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I love talking about vultures. It's yeah, uh, uh, well, it's, yeah, um, I'm one of those that have always been fascinated by vultures. Uh, and I think a lot of people, they might not like to admit it in public, but I think a lot of people do find that fascination. Let's see, is there anything else? So, um, a good book on crows, The Gifts of the Crow by John Marsloff and Tony Angel, uh, University of Washington, uh, seems to be a mecca for crow research. Hmm. Um, Suzanne Young, when we were in Arizona, got zone-tailed hawks confused with turkey vulture. Uh, so zone-tailed hawks, yeah, um, mimic the way turkey vultures fly um, is what I have heard. Uh, that if you see a turkey vulture in Arizona, you know, look twice because it might be a zone-tailed hawk. Yeah, that's what I've, <clears throat> when I've been out there, the bird guys always say, you know, don't just assume they're all vultures up there. Yeah. That's interesting. All right, Diana asks, how much does it cost to take care of a captive or injured vulture? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes, so they, uh, well, um, each turkey vulture uh, 
again, no matter if it's captive um, or if it's one that's been injured that's in rehab, usually eats um, 100 to 125 grams of food every day. Um, sometimes a little more than that if they, um, you know, are behind um, on their food intake. So 125 grams of food is about, uh, depending on the size of the mouse, um, it's about five mice, uh, four or five mice a day. Um, or, you know, maybe three, two or three day old chicken chicks. We don't say that around here anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, or, you know, a small rat. Um, so it adds up. We, we buy a lot of our food from a place called rodentpro.com, which is kind of funny. Uh, but they come, they come frozen already and we just have to thaw them and feed them to the birds. Mm -hmm. But uh, one mouse can cost... Um, I think I just, I just did an order. I think the mice were about 85 cents each. Um, sometimes they're closer to a dollar depending on what the, depending on, you know, supply and demand, I guess. But uh, I usually think of a mouse costing about a dollar. Um, so if your bird is eating five, four to five mice a day, uh, you know, it adds up. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, so we feed our birds, uh, Mice, rats, um, day-old chicken chicks, uh, two-week-old quail, um, and we also have a couple friends who are uh, bow hunters, um, uh, deer, you know, deer hunters who archery hunt, who will donate some of the deer meat to us, and it's really important that we only, we only take deer meat from people who kill the deer with a bow, with an arrow. Um, because we don't, and we still x-ray all the meat before we feed it to any of our birds, just in case there could have been some lead in it from somewhere. Uh, but we have one hunter who will chop up the ribs into like little chunks and the vultures just, and freeze, freeze them for us. And the vultures go, go crazy for the, uh, archery killed deer. Um, they also will eat fish. Um, we get fish, uh, that will sometimes feed them. Um, and they enjoy that too. Mm. And uh what else if we get any rogue killed squirrels or rabbits um they go to the vultures also okay um we'll do one last question here um um uh, peter bungie asks do they have anything to protect their eyes when they're eating oh um, well they have the, they have a nictitating membrane like the um like a lot of the uh a lot of species do to protect their eyes um and also the way that their nostrils are, I think I forgot to mention it, that, that having the nostrils up at the top like that too is supposed to, it, uh, is supposed to also protect them from getting stuff gunked into their nostrils while they're eating. Uh, so they do, and their eyes are set pretty far back on their, on their heads too. So they are um, out of the way of the, the, the guts, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but they do have that um, third eyelid to help protect their eyes. Okay. All right. Good. They have all kinds of amazing things. Yeah. All, all kinds of amazing adaptations. <laughs> Very misunderstood bird in so many ways. Yeah. That's usually if people say you're a vulture, you know, it's not a compliment, but yeah, I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, just anymore, you know, people used to call somebody a bird brain in a negative way. Well, now that's, very much a compliment based on what we're learning. Yes, um, and uh, our our, our non-releasable American crow actually lives with our two turkey vultures. So the three of them share an enclosure. And uh, it's really funny to watch the three of them interact. I mean, the crow is clearly th uh, clearly thinking things through. Um, and that crow, that crow hides things all over that enclosure. Um, and the turkey vultures watch the crow hide things and then they go and get what the crow has hidden. Oh my gosh. It's, uh, it's really neat. We have a couple places the crow can get to that the turkey vultures can't get to. So the crow will put, you know, the really good stuff there. Wow. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's neat to watch. The three of them will all sit together too, which is really kind of. Yeah, that's no, neat. neat. All right. Well, if people want a signed book, what would be the best way? Uh, go directly to you for that. Um, 
Um, a sign. I mean, so the book, if you don't want it signed, I mean, the book is on Amazon and the usual places. Um, but if you want, I'm happy. I have a, I have a stash of books, a big stash of books here. Uh, and I'm happy to sign them. I have a couple of the, the new version is about, um, is a little more expensive than the, um, old, the old version was about $15 and the new version, um, uh, the cover price is, is I think, 24 because um, the pictures are in color. Uh, but I have a couple of the old versions left, but I have a lot of the new version. Uh, if people, I think emailing me is probably the best way to uh, to make the arrangements. And I'm happy to sign it and put it in the mail. Um, who knows how long it'll take to get there. Uh, right. <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do that. I've got, I've got plenty of books and I've got a bunch of envelopes. Um, so my email was on one of my slides. Uh, it's just, you can email Katie at ACCAWV.org. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook if you want to, um, and Instagram. It all, it all goes to the same phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, ACCAWV.org. Yep. I also have a, Oh, there it is. Yeah. Katie at ACCAWV.org. Yep. I also use, I also have Katie at katiefallon.com. Um, oh, okay. Okay. I, you yeah. know. All right. I, but I'm happy to make arrangements and send them. Great. Great. Um, and I have to apologize to everybody. I, I always do this. I forget to introduce myself. Uh, a lot of you know me, but a lot of you probably don't. I'm Chris Eberly president of the Anne Arundel Bird Club. So I apologize uh, for not doing that uh, at the very beginning. Uh, but Katie, thank you so much. A um, lot of accolades people were typing in the chat. Um, look at the chat probably. This was a, this was a great, uh, great talk. We will uh, get the recording posted oh. and uh, let people know that is out there. Um, we look forward to hopefully getting you back with a little less drama sometime down the road here. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I meant to. I mean, I was looking forward to it. I know some people in the area and I'm just very, I was really excited about coming and I was, well, I was very mad about my stomach virus, obviously. Yeah. yeah. That year I was all, I was all ready to go. And, uh, you know, I have two uncles that live in the, live in the area down there. Um, and they were going to come see me and some cousins. Yeah. Well, let them know. Uh, I'll let you know the uh, where they can find the presentations. Uh, they've probably seen you give presentations before, but if not, they can see they can see a recording of it. Yeah, I'll pass well, that on. All right. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you everybody for uh, for being a part of this tonight. Thank you so much for having me. We are glad it. Yeah, very much worth the wait, as I said before. So. Uh, Thank you again, and thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. <laughs> a lot of applause. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Chris. Bye, Katie. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, bye. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> miss you guys. Jane. Oh, I miss you too. So much. Oh, gosh. So, for the Anne Arundel Bird Club people, I think what we're going to try to do is get a <laughs> bird club, a, an informal kind of bird club meeting without a presentation just for everybody to get caught up on things. All right. It's been, it's been long. It's good. So, stay tuned for those uh, announcements. Thanks, yeah, we, did, we did that in Patuxent Bird Club last week. We just had an informal group gathering with no presentation, and everybody really seemed to enjoy it. Yeah, and that's your your email back and forth. That that made me think that's that's something we need to do because yeah, people need mm -hmm. that. Um, but I think to do a presentation and that is a little much. So uh, Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So Katie, you wouldn't have had to endure our business and all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Katie, I did hear one thing about the wipers. I don't know. I haven't Googled this or anything. I, but I, I heard that um, of late, 
those, and I don't know how late, but those plastics or whatever they use in wipers and stuff like that uh, contain soy products. And so that they're palatable to rodents and all mm. kinds of animals. So huh. that's what I that makes sense that there's an ingredient in them that's tasty. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Katie, not to interrupt, this is Lloyd. This is the best presentation I think I've heard on Zoom yet. Oh. And I've seen a whole bunch. You, you do well, and your, okay. jokes, your jokes are great. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Very good. Yeah, I'm going to start looking for some of those cartoons that you've put up there, too. Those are. Yeah. It's good that a vulture advocate has some dark humor. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, that's great. And your kids just getting right in there with them. I think that is awesome. Oh, yeah. They love them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell them we're very impressed with them as well. I'll tell them. I mean, they don't, they don't know that they're ugly, the birds, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, dead, yeah, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and I think we all behold them as rather cool, especially those close-up pictures. They're just amazing. Yeah, neat birds. Well, speaking of my kids, I probably should yep. go here. All right, yeah. well, very good. Well, thank good night, you. everybody. Night. Night. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Good night, Chris. Night. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Tim Bob. I'm just down right now. Good night. <laughs>